was my grandmother. She received it when she was uh, 12 as a gift from her father. It's a significant age in Judaism, 12, it's bat mitzvah. She had it ever since, but she lost it and then found it and found it once again. Well, tell me the circumstances under which that happened. In uh, the winter of 44, yes. um, German uh, Nazi occupied Hungary and Romania, where my, my uh, family comes from. Yes. And um, they were all sent to a ghetto, but before the family was sent, um, the father dug a hole in the yard and just put all the family jewelry inside it and uh, hopefully to return one day. Mm -hmm. Well, they were all sent into the ghetto and then quite immediately sent to the concentration camp, Auschwitz, um, where practically all her family perished. She was the sole survivor. And uh, when she was finally released, she uh, find a, found her way back to Hungary and to her hometown. And uh, she came back to the house where they live and dug. And she found it in the yeah, garden. She found it. Extraordinary story, isn't it? And it's illustrated by this ring, isn't it? And it's the enduring qualities of precious stones. It's one of their deep fascinations, really. And in a way, it's almost too, um, too affecting for words, really, isn't it? For and me, it is. of course it is for everybody, for everybody, genuinely. And, and it's wonderful to be able to articulate it with something like this. Tell me the circumstances of how it's come to you. Well, she almost lost it again. 1956, there was a very short period of time where they could leave the country and uh, immigrate to Israel. But the only way they could do that is to leave everything behind, all the possessions, including jewelry. And I don't know how, but she they, got it into the country. Yeah, she managed to bring the ring. Fantastic. And it's a measure of the fact of its importance within the family, isn't yes. it? And hiding underneath these jewels is this subliminal law of the lapidary, which in happier times means something very joyful because the ruby stands for, for love and the diamond forever. And so in a way, that uh, resonance, that deep set meaning that goes back to deepest antiquity was taken with the ring um, to Israel and, and, and now it's been widened beyond that. But it's come to you from your mother or from? From my grandmother. I always loved this ring. Half a year before she passed, she said, and she wants me to have it. Yeah. She wants to see me happy. Ah, oh, yeah. well, that's the most one. And, and it seems almost that there's too much emotion and too much history uh, to, 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 to settle on an object yeah. like this. It's an extraordinary thing. But I must say, it's doing its job here. The sun's falling on it. <laughs> it's still immensely permanent. Those are the colors that your, your predecessors saw. And it saw them through the worst kind of turmoil and tragedy in their lives. Yeah. And, and in a way, it's, it's singing a silent song to us, which is absolutely marvelous. And the song begins in 1920, when this ring was made, in, in, in gold, fronted with platinum, and set with very pretty little Siam rubies and diamonds. And, um, and in a way, it's an impossible to put a value on such an object after the story that you told me. And I think the only way to value it is for us to put all that emotion aside and view it as a completely anonymous ring somewhere for sale um, without it being able to articulate its extraordinary story and to tell you that it would be possible to buy another one without that history for somewhere between eight and twelve hundred pounds. But in my view, it's a totally irrelevant subject. It's irrelevant to you and irrelevant in its meaning to your predecessors. And that's what's been the voyage of discovery today. And it's nothing to do with money. The sentimental value is huge, but I just think it's a beautiful ring.